All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I am Greg Fisher, the mayor of Louisville, and I'm happy to be here today. Uh, this is a big day for the city here as we get uh, some information, some we know about, some that's new for us as well, so we can continue on our path to improvement uh, as a city. Uh, I've been in mayor now for a little over three years, and I come from a business background, an entrepreneurial background, and I've seen audits of all types performed throughout my career, and I've seen responses of all types to audits uh, throughout my career as well. And I can say without a doubt that all audits always lead to better organizations, whether they're businesses, governments, or schools. And what I've seen is that audits help organizations and the people who run them continually improve. And they point out weaknesses that sometimes are difficult to see when you're doing the daily work of government, or in this case, a school system, or if it's a business audit. You're so involved with what's going in day in and day out, it's hard to come up sometimes and see what a third person will see when that audit is performed. In the case of city government, we've had a couple audits that to me have been really exciting. To other people, they've been uncomfortable. Uh, MSD was an audit that we had performed, and it came back with, the, or the audit results from the state auditor came back with over 100 plus recommendations that we could have looked at and said, oh my gosh, this is horrible. We wish that people didn't know about this. Or we could have said, which we did, was this is great. This gives us an opportunity to streamline our improvement efforts, to improve our delivery to the public. It's going to really help us. And, and in fact, what you are seeing right now is the results of those audits and the creation of something called One Water, where we're bringing the water company and MSD together. We'll end up saving over $20 million. Uh, for our taxpayers here and improve service at the same time. More recently, we had an audit performed on APCD, our Air Pollution Control District. Again, it spotted some things that I wish weren't there, but they were there. So it was derelict on us not to point them out and then obviously not to take action upon them. And the results will be cleaner air for our community and again, cost reduction and better technology at the same time. So th this type of response requires what we call a weakness orientation. And that is being super comfortable with talking about what we're doing that impedes us from being a world-class organization. And when I know, I know a lot of people at JCPS and certainly Dr. Hargens here, uh, being a world-class organization, being best in the world, there's no question that you guys are dedicated to that. So you want these type of weaknesses uh, delivered by a third party so you can say, okay, we agree with this, let's go to work with it. This one, uh, maybe we have a different perspective, but it's directionally correct. Let's go with this at the same time. So weakness orientation is super critical to any world-class organization. Then we're in the business, obviously, from government and public uh, school system like you all, where people demand accountability from us and we want them to be at the same time. And Dr. Hargens has been a super vocal advocate for saying that JPS, JCPS has got to be accountable and must become the best urban school district in the nation. And this audit is going to bring a fresh set of eyes uh, to that for our schools. And that obviously is a good thing uh, for our students and our kids here in the community as they're preparing to compete in a 21st century world. I want to thank uh, Dr. Hargens and celebrate the fact that you asked for this audit to start with over here about a year or so ago. And you knew the hard and difficult questions would be coming, and you all as a staff and board knew that at the same time. Uh, but as you said, college and career readiness is all we're focused on here at JCPS. Uh, you know there's a pathway to improvement there. And until we can say we're best in country, our job is not done. And even then when we say that, obviously, it's not done at the same time. Uh, all the time in our, in our school system and throughout our community, and your all's personal beliefs as well, I know you start with the never-ending principle that all kids can learn. It's a question of giving them the services, wraparound services that they get. Some of them don't get it in, the, in their families. We know that. And for people to say, well, it's the teacher's fault or it's the principal's fault. No, life is not that simple. So we're dealing with JCPS, with the school system that has almost two-thirds of its kids on free and reduced lunch. That presents challenges. But those are our challenges, right? And we've got to deal with those challenges. And as a community, it's our challenges to work. It's our challenge to embrace for all of us. The other issue on audits, obviously, is ensuring accountability for the citizens who pay taxes. 
and audits are a way then for us to help us grow and improve. I want to thank Auditor, State Auditor Adam Edlin for the work that he's done on this. He, he's got kind of a tough job. You know, he's called in to say, hey, Auditor Edlin, would you help us improve? And then sometimes when he digs in and comes back and says some things, people are like, oh, we don't like this guy. You know, uh, all he's doing is reporting what is auditing and is really helping us be a springboard or a catalyst for improvement as well. Some of the things in this audit have been reported in other audits as well. They might be packaged a little bit differently. Uh, there's some new uh, findings as well. But at the root of all these, obviously, is a basis for us to improve. And that's what this is all about. And it's simply good stewardship, not just from a financial standpoint, but more importantly, from the responsibility that we all have to make sure that every citizen, especially our youngest citizens, have an opportunity for their potential to flourish here in this community. And then my role as mayor, some people are saying, what's the mayor doing here? The mayor does not run the school system. I get that. Uh, but I've always said I believe the mayor's office, whomever the mayor should be, should be the conscience for the community for education and making sure that all of our kids and lifelong learners with adult learners have a city where they can continually pursue a learning that positions them to succeed in a 21st century economy. And obviously that's what positions our city to succeed in our 21st century economy as well. The other part, the role the city has to play in this is to celebrate the good work that goes on at JCPS at the same time. JCPS and the city of Louisville signed a compact <coughs> together about six months ago. Uh, one of the things that really tires me uh, is seeing uh, the media focus too much on negative news, whether it be the youth in our community, the shortcomings of any organization, picking here and picking there, but they don't stop up and celebrate the good work that goes on in many of our classrooms and many of our students in our community. Last night we celebrated 48 high school seniors that had overcome tremendous adversity. Refugee camps from Nepal, surviving the death, deaths of two uh, parents. Tremendous academic accomplishment. You know how much media was there, guys? None of you all. So part of the role that I like to play here is making sure that people see the success that's going on in the classroom as well. And that's another responsibility that I believe the mayor's office should have. So while we will celebrate as much as we can, we also want to kind of give a push on the back and say, hey, how can we help? Because we're here to help. We're not here to throw stones. So, here, uh, so today I'm here on behalf of obviously all the citizens of Louisville, on the employers in our city, we want the very best workers they can so they can be successful and pay the best wages and afford the best quality of life they can. I'm here on behalf of the taxpayers of Louisville who obviously want their money spent in the best possible way for the best results. I'm here on behalf of the parents of Louisville who, as we all know, the gener our generation that has kids right now, we're one of the first generations that are concerned about our kids having a better quality of life than we have and then what our parents had. It's the first time in, our, in the history of our country. So there's a lot of concern about preparing our kids for this rapidly changing world that we're in. And then I'm here obviously on behalf of the students of Louisville who deserve to be going to the very best large public urban school district in the country. So we all know in closing that so much of what happens in our city is driven by education. When we get to the root of every problem, whether it be violence or health or job creation, it all depends on education. And in Dr. Hargens, we have a superintendent who could not be more vocal without that, without qualification. Uh, she shouts this, we will be the best large public school district in the country. She relentlessly uh, attacks the data and uses that and pushes us forward as a community. And there's a lot of data, obviously, that I know she and her team and the board will use for improvement here <coughs> as we go forward. So. I'm uh, pleased to be here today so we can embrace this data and a weakness orientation and improve our community as we move forward so that all of our kids have the very brightest future possible. So with that, I guess, uh, Adam, are you coming up? So stay at Andre Edlin. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, as you know, we have reached a point nearly a year after in this very same room that we announced uh, that we were partnering to, to uh, go about the very important public endeavor of making a clear-eyed assessment of the status of the internal operation of the Jefferson County Public Schools. 
As Kentucky's taxpayer watchdog, it's my job to evaluate the effectiveness, efficiency, and integrity with which public dollars are administered. Our just completed performance audit of the central administration of the Jefferson County Public Schools represents something truly historic, the largest audit ever performed by the Kentucky Auditor of Public Accounts. With an annual budget of $1.2 billion, JCPS is Kentucky's second largest individual government, twice the size of Louisville Metro. With nearly 100,000 students, one in seven Kentucky kids is enrolled in the JCPS. The destinies of the JCPS and the Commonwealth of Kentucky are inextricably bound. In an era in which needs are increasing, yet resources are diminishing, when back-to-school <laughs> lists read like an inventory of janitorial supplies, when teachers are spending money from their pocketbooks to buy materials for our kids, we have an obligation to ensure that resources are getting to the classroom rather than being consumed by ever-increasing educational bureaucracies. It is in that vein that we partnered with Superintendent Donna Hargens and the school board to conduct a comprehensive review of the financial and administrative management of JCPS. Let me be clear. We know of no other school district anywhere in America that has invited this level of scrutiny. And it took a great deal of real courage to invite a review from the State Auditor's Office that has been aggressive about ferreting out waste and inefficiency in our schools, most recently sending a former Northern Kentucky superintendent to the federal penitentiary for his misdeeds. But the courage to do so has resulted in a roadmap for reform an inventory of strengths and weaknesses, challenges and opportunities. I believe that this report is crucial to realizing Dr. Hargan's vision of JCPS as the best run school district in America. There does exist a strong foundation on which that vision can be built. JCP boasts a remarkable 82% market share of eligible kids in public schools. The degree to which Louisvillians identify with their schools demonstrates a real pride in public education. JCPS teachers are paid well compared to benchmark districts nationally. Our auditors found no evidence of a culture of corruption in central office. And certainly we're blessed with representatives who take the time to serve on a school board with no meaningful compensation. But the challenges are enormous. JCPS does, did not have appropriate uh, and consistent comparative <coughs> benchmarks when we started this process. JCPS before has routinely chose new sets of peers which prevents it from consistently benchmarking itself for a wide variety of academic, financial, and operational metrics. When auditors were asked for a list of, when auditors asked for a list of benchmark districts, we were provided with a list of 34. Folks, when you benchmark against everyone, you're not benchmarking against anyone. In media reports from multiple years ago, JCPS reported New York City, Boston, and Chicago as comparative benchmarks. That just doesn't wash. We have to make sure that we have benchmarks that make sense if we're going to measure our performance and where we really stand. And with the help of Kentucky Education, former Kentucky Education Commissioner and nationally recognized education expert Gene Wilhoyt, we have established Austin Independent Schools, Baltimore County Maryland Public Schools, Charlotte Mecklenburg County North Carolina District, the Cobb County Georgia School District, and Pinella, Pinellas County Florida Schools as comparative benchmarks. These are high-performing districts with similar enrollments, budgets, and demographics. But the comparisons weren't always flattering. If you look here, you'll see that with only 53% of every ed education dollar used for student instruction, JCPS ranks lowest amongst these benchmarks. Fully 31% of every education dollar is spent in administration and operations, ranking JCPS highest amongst our benchmarks. While teachers represent 43% of the total staff of JCPS, that's significantly lower than all of our benchmarks. JCPS employs the highest percentage of school administrators relative to total staff of our benchmarks, doubling that of Charlotte Mecklenburg County, North Carolina. While JCPS has the second highest teacher to student ratio, which means more students to teachers, the system has the highest percentage of staff employed as teacher aides raising a question of whether the use of aids is being used to supplement a shortage of certified teachers. There are 369 administrators within JCPS making more than $100,000 a year. 
219 are employed in the schools, making the point about the high number of school level administrators. For comparison's sake, the whole of the executive branch of state government, with twice as many employees, has only 281 similarly salaried employees. JCPS administrators have the highest average salary of our peer districts, and 150 central office administrators make north of $100,000 a year. By comparison, Charlotte has 53, Austin has 39, and Cobb County, Georgia has 33. Yet the vast majority of teachers spend personal funds for the classroom, with most saying it's because the schools lack the resources they need. Most spend hundreds of dollars a year. Folks, a teacher should have the prerogative to use personal resources in the classroom, but no teacher should feel obligated because they have a lack of funding. Disturbing issues related to textbooks and instructional material were identified in surveys of teachers and benchmark institutions. J JCPS places more restrictions on students being able to take textbooks and instructional resources home than other Kentucky districts. This has the potential to put JCPS at an academic disadvantage. But not all of the problems are of the district's own making. The shameful state of JCPS textbook programs uh, compared to its benchmarks lies squarely at the feet of a state government that is either unable or unwilling to adequately fund education. The surveys also found that recent trends of, sh of shifting this burden to parents and students, asking them to supply janitorial supplies and a long list of back to school supplies is something that over the long term is not sustainable. Overall, the picture that emer emerges of the JCPS administration is one that is a massive bureaucracy that uses an outdated model, which has grown over time, consuming resources that ought to be driving excellence in the classroom. But with tremendous challenge comes historic opportunity. The leadership of the JCPS has the opportunity to modernize and reform its bureaucracy, freeing tens of millions of dollars over the long term to drive excellence in the classroom. And before we get in the business of condemning the Jefferson County Public Schools and their central administration for where they are, I think it's critically important that we acknowledge again that we know of no other school district in America that has invited this level of scrutiny from an independent taxpayer watchdog. And the first demonstration of confident leadership is a willing to look in the mirror and have a clear-eyed assessment, warts and all, of what our strengths and weaknesses are. And no serious reform effort, particularly one that has as much promise as I think this one has, is going to be successful without a clear-eyed assessment of where we start. Dr. Hargens has already begun the effort of streamlining the overhead at the highest levels of J JCPS. I think it's clear that her challenge is now to push that effort system-wide. Regrettably, the current structure and culture of the elected school board is insufficient to provide significant financial oversight for an organization with a $1.2 billion budget. I would point out that this is not unique to Jefferson County. My office has conducted now 16 special examinations in, of school districts around the state, and one of the disappointing threads that runs true is that we tend not to have structures or cultures in place that enable significant drill down into the important financial issues that guarantee effective taxpayer oversight. The absence of a budget or audit committee function pr provides no opportunity for drill down into the finance finances. Astoundingly, and by its own admission, there is no board review of such basics as year-over-year -year financials or budget to actual. As a result, we've recommended expanding the board by two at-large members whose focus could be more district-wide than the current constituency-based approach. Additionally, we've recommended the creation of budget and audit committees to facilitate a more comprehensive watchdog role from the board. The expanded watchdog role would also enable the board to de better demand improvement in a number of areas like contracting where we have detected some lax oversight. JCPS currently doesn't know how many contracts it has or what the total value of them are worth. Folks, that's not acceptable. Five years ago, the state began publishing all open contracts on a publicly accessible website. Taxpayers deserve no less of the Jefferson County Public Schools. Auditors found well over 1,700 contracts with private vendors, but that doesn't include professional service contracts under $5,000 or capital construction contracts. We found a lack of monitoring and oversight of contracts at the central level. 
Contracts are allowed to renew an unlimited number of times without reporting to the board. This is certainly not within the spirit of procurement laws, nor does it lend itself to transparency. Without periodic review, how can the board be sure it is getting the best price for goods and services? In some instances, signed written contracts were not maintained. Instances all were, also were noted of payments made for invoices and construction change orders that did not comply with contract terms or lacked required supporting documentation. Improvements to the contract and procurement processes are needed to increase transparency and ensure taxpayers that JCPS is a good steward of the public funds they receive. Creating a centralized, publicly accessible database of contracts is imperative in the digital age, particularly one in which accountability demands precision. It will come as a little surprise that a billion dollar entity has inefficiencies and outdated operations. We find that in almost every entity we look at. But it's hard to believe that an inefficiency that costs taxpayers at least $3 million a year has been ignored until now. Yet auditors found that JCPS continues to operate a costly and inefficient warehouse system. This is rich with irony given that Louisville is a global logistics capital. JCPS employs 59 people to operate a network of six warehouses that is charged with ordering, storing, and distributing supplies across the district. This has created a sizable payroll of employees and physical buildings that, that must be maintained and do incur utility cost. Auditors could find no cost benefit to doing this. Auditors found that the teachers complained of the supply system, quote, that moves at a glacial pace. One said she ordered a bulb for her projector at the start of the school year that didn't get to her until March. We recommend that the Jefferson County Public Schools begin unraveling this warehouse system and tra transition into a just-in-time delivery system. We believe that this could generate millions in recurring savings for the school system year over year. Significant weaknesses related to policies and procedures were also identified. Fortunately for taxpayers, no serious abuses or waste were found at the central office, but that doesn't mean it didn't occur in the past or can't occur in the future. I think that the fact that we haven't seen these abuses is largely a credit to the integrity of the people who populate this office. But what we need in the future is a more streamlined, more efficient, more modern, more reformed approach to delivering quality and excellence to the taxpayer in a digital age. When you don't have adequate and consistent controls over things like travel, credit cards, leave time, take home cars, cell phones, you are increasing that risk. The recent district internal uh, investigation into abuses at PRP shows precisely why tight controls must be in place. Consistency is key. JCPS doesn't have a consistent policy for salaried staff regarding the use of leave time for partial days. Auditors found that central office administrators were not required to use leave time for missing a partial day, but most teachers reported that they do use leave time for partial days. Not only that, but because the district doesn't have a mechanism for using less than a, a full day of leave time, many of those teachers are taking a full day off while only missing part of the actual work day. I believe this practice is unfair, and I think we need to streamline the process to make sure that the rules under which our frontline teachers operate is mirrored by our administrators. Having a strong internal audit function is imperative in, district, in a district the size of the JCPS. Auditors found that the internal audit department conducted a large number of audits each year, yet the quality of the work has been questioned. Risk levels weren't assessed in determining which audits to perform. An annual audit plan wasn't established. The board lacked an audit committee to oversee the work, and the internal audit director reported to the superintendent rather than the board. Folks, I think it's safe to say that the internal audit function here at JCPS has been a toothless tiger. But to the credit of the superintendent, who has already identified these, changes are being made that will result, I believe, in a culture and a structure uh, more given to accountability and oversight. A review of IT functions at JCPS identified serious concerns related to school safety plans and student privacy. While JCPS lacks oversight of the development of safety and emergency procedure manuals for each school. As a result, procedures exist in case of an emergency situation may be outdated or may not exist. The types of emergencies covered by these manuals include everything from abduction to a bomb threat, floods, and severe weather. Auditors also found that JCPS did not adequately protect sensitive <coughs> confidential student data. 
School districts are not only expected to provide kids with a world-class education, they are also obligated to protect them and their private data. Let me say in conclusion that the mission of this effort was to neither condemn nor cheerlead. Our effort focused on presenting the facts and providing a candid assessment of the internal operation of this critically important public school district. The leadership of JCPS demonstrated real courage in requesting this, this roadmap for reform. They will need more of that, as well as the galvanized support of the entire community in the effort to make JCPS the best run public school system in America. Folks, so much depends upon their efforts. One of the things that we were most proud of in putting this effort together was the degree to which we used state and national experts uh, in putting this together. And I want to recognize former Commissioner Gene Wilhoyt. Gene, where are you? Gene, why don't you come up and, uh, if you wouldn't mind, say a few words about how unique this approach is nationally uh, and what you have seen as both a state and national leader in education and the degree to which this can be used as an effective tool for reform. Thank you. Well, um, I'm not an auditor, uh, and as many of you know, I have a long experience in uh, public education, both in Kentucky and, and other, uh, other areas. And, and when approached uh, by the auditor's office about how I might help with this, um, it was one of my recommendations that we begin to benchmark against uh, other districts. And knowing that Jefferson County is on a mission, that mission being uh, the best urban school district in this country, then if we're going to make those comparisons, it's important that we do it against the best school districts in the country. So when you look at this audit report uh, and make comparisons with uh, these other five districts, remember, these are districts who are known for outstanding performance and efficiency. Now, this school district, this board, and, and this administration uh, are facing an unprecedented challenge uh, in American public education. We have never before in our country's history made the proclamation that we're going to educate every child. That's a very serious commitment. It is an awesome responsibility being placed on boards and superintendents. We now have a commitment to graduate every student, not 70% of them as the average across this country. We have a commitment that not only will we graduate those students, but those students are going to be prepared for a future of success in work and in citizenship. To meet that average commitment that we made among uh, school districts across this country, it's going to require deep thinking about how we do business traditionally and how we're going to do that in the future. This audit is a tool. And you measure the value of a tool uh, by the quality of that audit finding. And I would honestly say that this one goes beyond uh, what I have seen in terms of other audits uh, of school districts. It not only represents the findings of the interactions between the audit staff and Jefferson County uh, uh, personnel, it is uh, including in this a, a series of interviews with uh, teachers, with administrators in the district, teachers and administrators in school districts across Kentucky, and because Jefferson County is unique uh, with 100,000 uh, students, there is no other comparative district in this state. That's the reason we reached out to these other districts. And I would say uh, this audit provides not only a number of, of, of findings, but I think an actionable agenda. And so I think it leaves the board and it leaves the, the administration with a set of, of possible actions to take. And it's not the responsibility of the auditor nor anyone else to tell this district what to do and how to do it and what sort of process to use to get there. It is, however, a wonderful tool for Jefferson County Public Schools to deeply immerse themselves in the findings, determine among all of them which ones are going to be most uh, important to uh, undertake immediately. Uh, but I do think Without a doubt, there is real fodder here for improvement in the future. It is a tool that I think will get Jefferson County to that goal they have established, the number one school district, urban school district in the country. What a wonderful opportunity. What a great tool to have uh, to get there. So, thank you.
Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I do want to say that the quality of this work would not have been what it is without what was really Dr. Hargens and uh, Madam Chair, an extraordinary level of, con of, um, of, of uh, cooperation over the last uh, year. Um, certainly, uh, auditors uh, can be unsettling when their presence in the office of people are trying to do their work. Uh, but the degree to which uh, professionals uh, worked with us to make sure that we had a well-established fact pattern, um, the lack of defensiveness was something that I think is an extraordinary compliment uh, to the way, Dr. Hargens, not only that you have addressed this audit in the process, but clearly I think the rest of your leadership team uh, and, and the board have adopted a similar approach. And that's something for which um, I'm deeply appreciative. If you can imagine, not everyone is respectful and polite of my auditors. And when we have the opportunity to see them treated as professionals, uh, it's something that I wanted to make note that we mentioned. Um, certainly a big part of that level of cooperation was the relationship we've had with the chair. And I think she's gonna make some comments now. Good morning. I'm Diane Porter, Chairperson, Chairwoman of the Jefferson County Board of Education. Thank you for being here. I'd like to introduce my colleagues on the board. Uh, so I think you know who they are, but I always like to recognize them for their work and for being here this morning. Uh, board Member Brady, if you'd stand, please. Ms. Haddad, Board Member Jones, and Board Member Westland. Thank you so much. Uh, I am proud to serve with the members of the Jefferson County Board of Education. Thank you to everyone for being here today and thank you for being a part of our dedicated continuous improvement efforts. The goal of the Jefferson County Public Schools and the Jefferson County Board of Education is for all school students to graduate prepared. We remind ourselves and our community of that at the beginning of every board meeting. It guides all of our conversations and decisions including the important decision to partner with State Auditor Adam Edlin's office. To provide the best possible education for our students, we know we must ask the hard questions and capitalize on the opportunities for improvement. We did both when we began our collaboration with the auditor. We also strengthened our deep commitment to efficiency and transparency within JCPS. Today, we received the auditor's recommendations and an additional piece of the map on our journey to becoming the best urban school district in the nation. His guidance aligns with several initiatives we have already Im implemented, or are currently implementing, and we look forward to hearing additional proposals from JCPS staff based on his findings. We know our district is moving in the right direction, and this will provide additional momentum. I commend my fellow board members for having the courage to embrace this review with an eye toward continuous improvement. On behalf of the board, I would like to thank Auditor Edlin and his office for their diligent work. I would also like to thank the dedicated JCPS employees who have assisted with this process. Your teamwork benefits us all, and especially the students of the Jefferson County Public Schools. To our community, I want you to know that we are focused, fearless, and steadfast in our resolve to achieve our vision. All students graduate prepared. I thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. It's my honor to introduce our superintendent, Dr. Donald Harkins. Thank you very much. And I'd like to acknowledge the members of the superintendent's cabinet, if they would stand, uh, Dr. <coughs> Razor, Dr. Hensley, Ms. Harden, Dr. Radowski, and Mr. Marshall. I appreciate their leadership and their uh, cooperation uh, with the state auditor. As, ha as has been said, in April 2013, JCPS and the Jefferson County Board of Education took a bold step on the path of continuous improvement by enlisting the expertise of the auditor's office. For the past year, we have worked with the State Auditor's Office so that they could thoroughly evaluate our use of resources and our policies and procedures to ensure that they are aligned with the vision of all students graduating prepared. 
It is clear that we share the same core belief with Mr. Edlin that our students must be the center of our universe. Working together to maximize efficiency will ultimately positively impact student achievement. The purpose of this review was twofold. First, to provide a detailed financial and procedural roadmap to guide us on our journey to becoming the best urban district. Second, to gain an objective third party analysis of our operations to provide transparency to taxpayers. I am pleased, but unsurprised, that this extensive review found no evidence of fraud or unethical behavior. It did, however, enlighten our staff about many ways in which we can improve our operations. Several recommendations from this review are reflective of changes we have already made or started. The Jefferson County Board of Education is currently undergoing a complete review of JCPS policies to ensure they provide specific guidance to staff. One of the focus areas in our strategic plan is to ensure that all schools are staffed, resourced, and supported. To do that, we reduced central office staff, froze central office positions, and froze administrative salaries for 1213. This report, however, provides a roadmap for continuous improvement in this area. We are in the process of hiring a new director of internal audit and investigations. During our 14-15 budget presentation, we notified the board we will eliminate take-home vehicles and will develop written procedures related to the usage of JCPS-owned vehicles. Of the 45 findings, 16 were classified as information technology. Many of the technology findings relate to software and network systems uh, controlled by the Kentucky Department of Education. We will work closely with our partners in KDE to investigate areas of potential improvement and to employ a risk-based approach to ensure protective measures are implemented where warranted. Plus, we will be evaluating the recommendations in detail in the coming weeks, and we will create an action plan to present to our board for approval. But it really is important to remember how far we've come. It's important that we recognize the Jefferson County Board of Education for its commitment to continuous improvement. The analyses that we've invited upon our district in the last three years have come from this board. Dr. Gary Orfield's report challenged JCPS using current census data to use the diversity already existing in our city so that we can offer more families the choice they desire provide a more efficient and automated process, and reduce ride times for students. That benefits families and taxpayers. The curriculum management audit and district reorganization provided us a roadmap for creating systems to support student achievement while creating a more efficient and aligned organizational structure. Advanced Ed awarded JCPS district accreditation and benchmarked us against national standards. They noted the following powerful practices. Community partnerships, the strategic plan, Vision 2015, our openness and transparency, and our refocus on students and schools and student achievement. The Magnet Schools of America, who recently reviewed us, stated from their report, and I quote, a community like Jefferson County, with its appreciation for diversity and choice, should serve as a lighthouse for others who strive for equity and improvement for all students. This report, referring to the Magnet Review, will serve as a foundational document that will make access to opportunity more equitable, transparent, and truly prepare students to thrive in a global society. The GE Foundation Review found us to be a moving and improving district. We know if we are not moving forward, we are falling behind. We must move forward to benefit our students. The previous reviews have guided improvement and have been a catalyst for action. 
the curriculum management audit and restructuring of cabinet and other positions resulted in $4.4 million in savings in 11-12. Remember, administrative salaries were frozen in 12-13. Every vacant central office position is frozen until it's analyzed about how it aligns with our district's mission. Positions, when possible, have been reclassified. We've decreased travel costs by a third since 11-12 and non-instructional food by two-thirds in that time. I know that moving dollars and human capital into the classroom from central office had a significant impact on JCPS reaching its annual measurable objective, its achievement target for 12-13. We know that achievement arrows, which is job number one, are moving in the right direction. This is evidence that we're not standing still. We are not satisfied. Complacency <laughs> has no place in our work. We are all committed to change that leads to improvement. We have talented and hardworking teachers and staff members who support their work, who are dedicated to our vision that all students will graduate prepared. And we know that we have a talented community with great expertise that we want and need as part of this comp continuous improvement effort. Again, on behalf of JCPS, we would like to express our appreciation to State Auditor Edlin and his staff for the in-depth and professional manner in which this review was conducted. I often say it's important that we are all rowing in the same direction for the benefit of these amazing students. State Auditor Edlin, thank you for rowing with us. I think we're ready for questions. Yes, ma'am. I'm um, not really sure where to get, begin, but my first question is why you looked at 2010 expenditures when you had other numbers to look at? Because 2010 was before the, the, the freeze of central office positions, was before the assistant principals were added. It was before these counselors were added. So my question is, why did you look at 2010-11 when you had 11, 12, 12? Brian. <clears throat> For comparison purposes, we wanted to be able to compare JCPS to other districts. And that was the um, latest information that was available in order to compare JCPS and benchmark them against other uh, districts throughout the country. One of the things we relied on was the National Center for Educational Statistics which is nationally recognized as the uh, inventory of uh, district, district maintenance and district performance around the country. And that's the, that's the data that we had to rely on in order to be able to make benchmark comparisons. Sure, but right now, that's not what this district looks like, correct? I mean, the district has added all these assistant principals. They've yeah. added, I'm just having a hard time. I understand the comparisons, but if you go into a classroom right now, that's not what you're seeing. It's not what I see when I go to classroom. Right. No, I appreciate the question, but uh, in order to be able to determine uh, the information uh, from the information that we had available, um, the different comparisons that we had, that was the only comparable data. Have changes been made? Yes. But does it point to an opportunity to improve? Does it point to an opportunity of where they started out? Yes. We haven't seen during that period of time um, types of changes that you would anticipate that would significantly influence these particular numbers or comparisons. So I still think that it is a good benchmark. It's something that we also recommend throughout the report that they continue this benchmarking process against these other districts that were peer districts identified so that they could see historically over a period of time how they're improving or if they're falling behind and it gives them that roadmap to continue in the future. Can you talk a little bit more about the types of student data that was not protected, how it was not protected, and whether any of it was compromised by anybody from the outside? No evidence that it was compromised. And I want to point out that uh, governments, who, governments who, in their, their natural function, necessarily collect data on their customers, uh, taxpayers, whomever. And JCPS is in a similar position that we have found in our, in our IT function as we have done reviews of institutions, education related and otherwise, 
that we just don't do enough in Kentucky, not just in the JCPS, but in a lot of our entities to protect the data that we have. So um, one of the things that we did was we passed House Bill 5 this year that enables, uh, that requires school districts to do more to protect their data. Certainly the school system would be covered as part of that. Uh, but beyond that, it requires that if there is a breach, then, then the folks whose information has been breached uh, have a requirement that they be notified by their institution. So um, as you can imagine, uh, any school system collects an extraordinary amount of data on its students from names and social security numbers to allergies to the people who are authorized to pick them up. And that's, um, that's an important finding of our IT function, but it is not unique to Jefferson County Public Schools. It's literally something we're struggling with everywhere. So just the protections within the IT system, the firewall, so sure. to speak, and, wasn't and, strong know, enough? Sure, and you know, computers, uh, uh, former employees who, uh, who leave computers not being wiped, uh, a process not being in place to clean data when computers are transitioned out. You know, those sorts of things are the housekeeping items that really are, are uh, significant in that they go a long way to protecting data. One follow-up, sure. um, we talked a lot about the money not getting to the classroom compared to the benchmarks and, and the money being spent in central office higher than the benchmarks. What evidence is there that those other benchmark districts have higher test scores for their students well, this, as a result? As I think Commissioner Wilhoit pointed out, the benchmarks were chosen. We didn't go fishing for benchmarks. We looked for, uh, we looked for districts that reflected a certain profile, that is high performing, uh, that is similar budgets and enrollment and similar demography and these are the ones that we came up with because if you have the ambition, the appropriate ambition which we have here in Jefferson County to be the greatest school system, best run school system in America, you have to, you have to compare yourselves against the high performers. So that's the approach we've taken and I think um, as stated by the efforts that Dr. Hargens has begun since she became the, the superintendent here, I think everyone acknowledges that there is a amount of bloat in the administration. The question is, how do you develop a roadmap for thinning out that bloat and getting to the getting resources to the classroom where they can affect student performance? And I think having an analysis done at the request of this entity uh, about where we stand in comparison and what can be done, I think is an extraordinarily important first step. But do they have higher test scores? That's what sure. I'm saying. Sure. Yes. The other benchmark They're, yes. districts do have higher yeah. tests. But remember, our function here was to evaluate the internal business operation of the Jefferson County Public Schools. Um, and it's very important in my line of work that we not get into mission creep. And um, that's why we focused on the internal management and financial functions of this organization. Yes, sir. You described it as bloat here. Um, in your communication with teachers, were they telling you that the, uh, besides supplies that resources were not in the classroom for them, uh, more importantly, more certified teachers, uh, teacher-student ratio, that they had enough help in problem schools? Uh, it's, it, it was important as we were conducting an assessment of how Jefferson County Public Schools Central Administration services the classroom. We thought it critically important that we survey those that are actually in the classroom. And about 1,200, I believe, of the 6,000 teachers took the time to respond. And their feedback was informative. Uh, too often they spoke of having to spend more than they would like out of their own pockets to buy materials for our kids because there aren't adequate resources to do that. There were uh, complaints about the size and, and scope of the Jefferson County Central Office. So I think it's clear, um, especially with an administration that I believe is focused on making sure that we have more resources in the classroom, I think it's awfully important that you ask the teachers what their, what their view of the operation of central office is. Because I, I, the one thing I hope that we have broad consensus around is a belief that central office and administration, both here and in the schools, exist to support what goes on in the classroom. More direct, I'm, uh, are you talking about more books, pens, and paste, or actual certified teachers All in the, the schools? All the above. Jefferson County Public Schools has the lowest number of teachers uh, as a percentage of staff compared to any of the benchmarks. And one of the questions that I don't have the expertise, nor, neither do my staff, but now I think the board has a, is in a position to ask, is, is the utilization of teachers' aides being used to supplement too few teachers? I don't have an answer for that. But now we have a board that has the information available to them that they can ask critical questions like that to find out if that's been part of a culture here and how the schools have been run for a long time. 
Sure. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Okay, so going to the um, context of teachers having to use their, going out of their own pocket. Right. So JCPS is at 93%, Kentucky's at 95%, That's and the right. national average is at 99%. Are you implying, you're saying that, the, that it's because of bloat at the central office level in the schools. Are you implying that all these districts are bloated then? I, I think, I do think that we have issues of a uh, large degree of administrative overhead being a common theme certainly across Kentucky, and we've seen it in a number of the places that we've surveyed. But I would point out to you, it's not me saying that they're not getting the resources. You need only listen to the teachers that we surveyed who have been very clear that they're having to spend money out of their pockets to buy materials for our kids because they feel like there aren't enough resources to support their actions in the classroom. So you don't have to take it from me. You only have to take it from the teachers that we asked. Yes, sir. We ask questions sure, for Ms. Porter and Ms. Hargis. Um, let's start with you, Ms. Porter. Um, I think at one point this says, <laughs> uh, you know, when it talks about a lack of board oversight, um, and talks about board members not knowing what line items in the budget means, that's pretty eye-opening to taxpayers. Did you see that? And, and what was the board doing if they weren't paying attention to the budget? I think the board did. How much time do we spend looking at the budget? We have work sessions to look at the budget. To uh, We are presented with information uh, line by line in some cases, and we have an opportunity to ask questions. The state of Kentucky is now requiring additional hours for school board members with, with for financial training. So um, the budget is intense. There are a lot of line items, and we spend time looking at it individually. What is the level of understanding? It's kind of like in the classroom, what is the level of understanding of every child in the classroom. So uh, I'm not sure I've answered your question, but I've given you a little bit of information about how we go through the process and what the requirements are for school board members affected this year. Let me ask it a little bit more plainly. Do you think the board was falling down on the job by not paying close enough attention to the budget? I don't think our board is falling down on the job. I think it's uh, a tremendous amount of time that is needed to spend on the budget and other items. So, um, no, I do not think the, bud the uh, school board has fallen down or is falling down. I think that we spend a lot of time and we spend time talking about how we will direct our work to do it efficiently and effectively for the good of the district. Does that help? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Thank you. So there are about 200 recommendations. Were any of them really surprising? And I'd like uh, Superintendent Hargens to answer this as well. Really surprising to you. Obviously, there's a lot that I could assume as a reporter, but also I, I believe the board already knew. Um, anything that was really surprising that you think is going to be useful to you as you consider your action plan? Actually, not surprising, but very useful. So all of the recommendations, again, we will turn into an action plan, take it to our board for approval. But in terms of making the budget understandable, I can tell you two specific things that we've undertaken to work to make it more understandable. Uh, Cordelia Harden, our CFO, uh, and I work with a group of business leaders in the community who are experts uh, in, in explaining how to uh, make the budget understandable. I hope what you're hearing here is we want every taxpayer to understand where every dollar is and that it's going for the benefit of students. So we're working to make it more understandable, not to make it not understandable. The other thing that CFO Harden has done is initiated a um, application to our MUNA system that will allow our board and this community to drill down. So if you want to know how much we're spent how much was spent on textbooks at a particular elementary school. Our board could look at that. Uh, media could look at that. State Auditor Edling can look at that. We are really working to make sure that 
every dollar goes towards students and that we're totally transparent uh, to the taxpayers. So, so those are two specific things that we've already undertaken, uh, again, to make it very clear to our board. Uh, and I think staff has a responsibility, too, to make sure that things are presented in a very clear, uh, concise way. So it's a, it's a reciprocal responsibility, and we're working to do that. I'd like to just add on, make, give, give a little context to the, to the oversight issue. Um, the issues with the school board in terms of overseeing its budget were issues of culture and structure. Um, largely here, you have a culture that, you, that we have found uh, almost everywhere else that we've looked, which is a high reliance by the board on staff to provide the information that they need to make judgments about financial condition. And certainly you've got able staff here. But the problem with that is, is that you have to have a culture based on a trust but verify system. And you don't have that here in Jefferson County because you don't have a structure in place that facilitates the kind of drill down that you have to have to be able to ask difficult questions. I mean, when you consider for the fact that this is the second largest individual government in Kentucky, a budget of a billion two, that lacks a finance committee, that lacks a budget committee, that lacks an audit committee, that's not conducive to the kind of financial oversight I think the taxpayers deserve. So if we get into this business of questioning the commitment of specific board members, I think what we lose is the greater issue is that board members come and go structures that guarantee the firm and vigilant oversight of taxpayers must be in place. We can't have a system of good governance based on personalities. We have to have a system of good governance based on structure. And what we have here is the absence of structure. So we've made a recommendation that there ought to be a finance committee. There ought to be, um, there ought to be a budget committee. Internal audit ought to be beefed up, which it's being done, and it ought to have a committee that it reports to on the board. And beyond all of that, a seven-member board, in my view, and there are other people who are going to disagree, and certainly my recommendations don't have the force of law, but a seven-member board is not sufficient to govern a $1.2 billion organization, particularly one that cries out, in my view, for a little more global perspective. And if you have two more members, and keep in mind, these folks make maybe $3,000 a year. We're not, talking about, we're not talking about people are getting rich in the service to their public. But if you expand that board, you provide a more global opportunity for people to be involved. Um, because the function of the board right now, necessarily, it's these people's job to be champions for their constituencies. And they do a good job of it. But we've got to have structures in place that enable a more specific drill down, uh, more specific vigilance on the, uh, the way that a billion two is spent in public resources. So this is about structures, not just about people. This is about having structures in place that guarantee effective oversight. People come and go. Yes, ma'am. One question in here. You, you talk about the, um, the taxpayers' money and costing millions of dollars. Do you have an exact figure on how many more millions of dollars are being spent than should? Uh, listen, when we, look at, uh, when we look at the metrics that we've now established, so for instance, take the figure of central office employees making north of $100,000 a year. There are 150. When you compare that to our benchmarks of similar size, and consider I think Charlotte has 40,000 more students than the Jefferson County public school system, yet a third of the number of administrators making that amount of money, um, there's a real opportunity to generate significant savings. Now one of the things that we found that I think will be highly conducive to effective decision making on the board is that the tenure of the average employee of those that's making $100,000 a year is 18.1 years. So as retirements come about, and we have, we have position freezes in place, there are abilities to drive economies to get us into a better place um, in, in saving the monies that I think that we need to save to get to the classroom. But if you look at the totality of this study, there's no question that over the long term, uh, with, with the leadership of this board uh, implementing recommendations and finding new economies, we're talking about potentially tens of millions of dollars stripped out of the bureaucracy and sent to the classroom. And that's a real impact. So are you saying that the salaries and administrators should be pared down or that the There's no question. I don't, I don't think when you compare us to our benchmarks that there's any way to defend this many, this many people making that much money. And I think part of it is, is that, and I've had this conversation with, uh, with, with senior leaders here, 
that uh, you've got a culture in which there's not a lot of churn here in central office. There's not a lot of new blood being infused. You have an awful lot of people who have been here for a very long time. And as a net result of that, you see their salaries compile over a number of years. And I think that's something that the board is now going to be in a position to evaluate to make sure that we, we're streamlined and to make sure that we're better in line with benchmarks. How many more teachers do you think should be in the classrooms? Well, uh, JCPS has the fewest number of teachers as a percentage staff of any of our benchmarks. And if, if you go back into the study, you'll see that uh, I think it's 40 percent of teachers as a percentage of staff is 43, uh, 43, about just over 43 percent. In Cobb County, it's 55. Uh, it looks to me like the, the in-between there is somewhere around 50 percent. That's significant. I mean, that's a, that's a significant number of teachers considering that you've got 6,100 teachers in this district, Brent, you know, about 6,100 teachers. Um, clearly, we know that educational excellence is largely driven by really talented teachers in the classroom. I think we have a concern that here in Jefferson County we don't have enough of them. Devin. Uh, Dr. Harkins, again, um, you know your central office administration more than, more than anybody. Are there too many people in that office making these higher salaries? I know you value all of them, but are there too many that are making the, the higher salaries that we're speaking of? Well, actually, the, the report says that we have the right number of central office staff, and the organizational review that we had in the first year that I was here said the same thing. But it clearly says, benchmarked against other districts, uh, that the salaries are higher. Uh, for those positions. So this gives us an opportunity to actually look at that and review that. So, uh, and to benchmark our, ourselves against another large district, I think is important. So, uh, so we're gonna be reviewing that and looking at that. So clearly we have, uh, the, uh, you can't argue with data that we have three times as many as, as the next largest school district or the next district that has the largest amount. So that would indicate that there are. Before you ask your question, I just wanted to clarify something about committees. The year that this uh, data was taken, there was a finance committee from the board. This year, we discussed our organization in a board organization session. We discussed uh, committees, how we would function as a board. We do that annually. It was the decision this year only uh, to not have the finance committee. We will discuss that again next year and determine how we will do our work. So when this study was taken, there was a finance committee. I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Dr. Hargens, I have a question for you. Um, so two years ago, the district did the curriculum management audit. And one of the things um, Phi Delta Kappa said was that central office was not excessive compared to other districts in terms of salaries. And that one of the things that they recommended was a study of comparison of compensation. Um, <coughs> What's the status of that? I'm not aware. Have you started that compensation comparison? What is the status of that? Well, actually, uh, we have not. That was a recommendation in the audit. And I think, just to be clear, is what they said is that we have the right, the, maybe the, the right number of people. But I think salaries uh, were questioned in both that and uh, in this one. So that needs to be a review. And I think what uh, State Auditor Edlin said is exactly right. Over time, given our salary structure, given the way that raises um, are given, those salaries happened over time. Those salaries certainly didn't happen overnight. So it's a matter, uh, and I don't think the salary or the compensation schedule has been reviewed uh, for many years. So it's an opportunity here to look at that. And I do want to emphasize that you know that that we do have wonderful people working in central office. Uh, so uh, I, and I know we all know that. Uh, so these are really two separate questions. Is, uh, is the salary commensurate and benchmarked against other districts? But there's no question we have people uh, that, that would rival any of those other districts. And we have people that I bet those other districts would love to have and recruit. Don't you think that, Commissioner Wilhoit? Um, I think they would, so. If I'm not mistaken, in here, there was also a teacher salary comparison, and JCPS teachers got paid more we did. We than other that. districts. Is that a bad thing? No, I think it's a good thing. I acknowledge that is in, in my remarks is one of the, there are reasons why there's a solid foundation here on which to build a vision 
to make this the best run school system in the country. And one of those is, is that teachers, uh, compared to the benchmarks, are well paid. And I think compensating teachers is extraordinarily important. And it's something that clearly here in Jefferson County Public Schools, compared to industry leaders, does well. And I think that's something uh, the district and those who represent teachers ought to be proud of. Isn't there a thought, though, that just overall we have a school district where people get paid more? I mean, how do you bring down one set of salaries while keeping the other set of salaries well, it's, it's I, Well, I think it's based on a value judgment. And I think all the people in this room, including the administrators, know that they exist to support the teachers in the classroom. So while you have the highest uh, paid teachers in the, uh, amongst the benchmarks, you also have the lowest number. So I think you know this is a this is a policy decision for the elected board and the superintendent they employ, but clearly there needs to be a conversation about whether or not the degree to which we need to hire new teachers, and um, I think I think that's extraordinarily important. Jefferson County Public Schools also have the highest salary of administrators compared to benchmarks at sixty four thousand dollars a year. So uh, the notion that you know, listen, I'm I'm not going to make the argument. Matter of fact, I would make the other argument that we're paying teachers too much. Uh, given with what they have to put up in the classroom and certainly with what's going on in the world today, not only are they instructing our children, but they're social workers and disciplinarians and parents uh, and dietitians. Um, I, I think we're doing right by our teachers. But uh, I think the challenge here in Jefferson County is a meaningful discussion about whether we need more of it. Diane, if you don't mind. Um, what is, I want you to reiterate your message to the community because I think the last couple of years, I think all the community has seen is we want tax increases, we want tax increases, but now we're using words like bureaucracy and too much money is being spent. So I would just like you to reiterate what your message is to the community on how the board will handle this stepping forward. What the board will do is we will rely on staff to report back to us the findings of um, this report. The board will consider um, the dynamics of our budget, the dynamics of what local schools need, but more importantly, what's important for the students. So we have that conversation every year. We have to be able to justify to the taxpayers how we're spending the money and why we're spending the money. I'm not exactly sure if that gives you the answer, but we as a board make that decision based on many variables. Does that help? It does, and I'm just wondering, because your, your budget is going to be approved this Monday, so is that, does this do anything to prohibit you from moving forward with your next budget? One of the things I've learned is not to speak for the board, although I'm the chair of the board. We are a group, and we will have to have that discussion. So I'm not going to speak for the board at this point, because it is a board vote. I want to, before we end, uh, I want to circle back, Adam, to the student performance piece one more time, because I think it's important. Can you discuss in greater detail how the uh, inefficiencies with money compared to our benchmarks, how that translates in these other districts to higher test scores. I can't because it's outside the scope of the audit. The so you didn't look at the test scores? You know, certainly we established, when I talk about high performers, these districts are places that enjoy a high level of academic achievement. But you, you got to understand that the, the central element of this study was to evaluate the way that the management here allocates and expends resources to support the classroom from here in central office. So uh, that's certainly important, but I think anecdotally we, all, we, we know that there is a connection between uh, resources in the classroom and getting student performance. And I think what we're working on here and what Dr. Hargan's ordered and we produced for her is an assessment of how big the bureaucracy is here and the level of resources that ought to be getting to the classroom that aren't because we have a bureaucracy that's grown, grown up over the years. With, with all respect, and just to be clear, did you look at test scores with our district compared to the benchmarks? Certainly and, we did. And you found evidence that the, the, the money Listen, I, know, I can't, I'm, I am an auditor, and we, we can only follow the facts where they take us. Certainly we use student performance as a metric for selecting the benchmarks that we have. 
But if you're asking me whether, based on the work that we've done today, that I can, I can tie getting $15 million more from the bureaucracy into, an, into a classroom, the degree to which that's going to affect student performance, I cannot. That's, um, that, that's not, that wasn't our function here. Our function here was to essentially do an efficiency assessment of the bureaucracy and evaluate its relationship to the classroom, which is precisely what we've done. Anybody else? I think we've answered every question they've got. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I, do, I do think it's important to note that the next steps are that the, uh, the system uh, will file with my office in 60 days unless they request an extension, um, their progress in, or plan for addressing the issues that we've raised. And that's something that we'll continue to work uh, to, with the district to whatever degree they'd like us to to make sure that we do that in a manner that's satisfactory for the taxpayers. Thank you all very much.